cancer since 2012. Uh, before I introduce the speaker, please remember that you have index cards in your folders and you can write down questions and we'll have a question and answer session immediately following. I'll collect the cards. Um, Dr. Timothy Zagar is an assistant professor of radiation oncology. His in research interest focuses on agents that enhance the effectiveness of radiation treatment, including chemotherapy and hypothermia. He is a member of the UNC Breast Cancer Center and the Multidisciplinary Thoracic Oncology Program. Dr. Zagar graduated magna cum laude from Georgetown University and earned his MD from Mount Sinai. Sinai School of Medicine. He completed his radiation oncology residency at Duke University. Please join me in welcome, welcoming Dr. Sagar. Thanks. So it, it's a pleasure to be here talking to this small group about um, a topic that is near and dear to my heart. Um, like Colleen said, I'm a radiation oncologist, and kind of the wheelhouse of most radiation oncologists is what we do is we treat a lot of brain metastases. Sadly, that's true. Um, and I will talk about uh, basically our, our paradigm at UNC. We have a multidisciplinary management where I see a lot of patients along with a fellow neurosurgeon as well as Carrie Anders, who helped organize this whole uh, spiel, who is a medical oncologist. So, um, this is very informal. Uh, we can definitely do the cards if you guys want to write down questions at the end or if something is burning, just scream at me. Okay, I don't have any disclosures that are relevant. So just kind of an overview slide. Um, I'll give you some background. I'm going to define what brain metastases are. Prognostic factors, uh, which ones are important, not just related to the breast, um, but related to other important things. And then we're going to focus the, the meat of the talk on what are the best treatment options. Um, and in reality, I don't know if we know the best treatment options, and it's in constant evolution. And then we can talk about some future directions, uh, particularly at UNC in some of our research interests. So um, I must say that I treat primarily breast and lung cancer. So I treat a lot of breast patients, but I'd never heard the stage four needs more. And I think that that's one of the catchiest um, phrases, and I, in fact, I went and picked up a shirt. I love it. And in reality, in s stage four breast cancer is a spectrum, okay? Breast cancer is different from lung cancer. Stage four breast cancer, there are no two people alike. There are, you know, we saw some woman today, she stood up, she had lived 20 years with metastatic breast cancer. Um, breast cancer brain mets needs more, okay? And we'll talk about this. I'm going to jump to this this point here that most clinical trials in stage four breast cancer, if you have CNS METs or brain METs, you're out. You can't be in the trial. Um, so as a result, it, it is a devastating um, consequence because we often don't know what to do with our patients. What's uh, CNS? Uh, central nervous system. Sorry, I should just say brain, but that includes the brain and the spinal cord. Um, and then if you look all over the map, some people say that patients with, when I say advanced, metastatic breast cancer, some say as many as 30% of HER2 positive women develop brain mets, 50% of triple negative breast cancer patients that are already metastatic may develop brain mets. Um, there's something called the blood-brain barrier. Uh, whoever made us was pretty smart. Um, the brain is obviously very important. Bad things aren't supposed to get in, so there is literally a, a barrier uh, which limits exposure to systemic therapies like chemotherapy, hormone therapy, which as a result, brain metastases usually fall in my lap because I'm a radiation oncologist. And what's unique about UNC is our medical oncologists are very interested in getting systemic therapies that can actually get into the blood-brain barrier. Um, when you'll see the word preclinical model. So our keynote speaker talked about phase one, phase two, and phase three trials. Those are in humans, okay? So oftentimes we need to start in non-humans, in cultures, in mice, to see if we can generic, uh, engineer medicines that can then maybe work in humans. So what is a brain metastasis? You'll probably hear me slip and say brain met. It's a lot easier. Um, yes. Right? Yeah, I'm tired of saying it. We get it. All right, OK. So yeah, and if I'm talking too much, just feel free to tell me to shut up. So this is a brain MRI and of, a, of a patient of mine, and you can see this is all normal brain, right side of the body, left side of the body. And you can see this little 
kind of one centimeter, half an inch little rim enhancing nodule. This is a brain metastasis. This is an area of cancer that started in a woman's breast and made it through the blood-brain barrier and wound up there, okay? I can't emphasize this enough. Not only is stage four disease a continuous, uh, a huge spectrum, but so are brain mets, okay? So not all brain mets are created equal. You can see just looking at this that this patient has more spots than the prior patient. This is a bone metastasis, which happened to metastasize to the skull. So this is not technically a brain metastasis. So I just want, to, I want you guys to know that sometimes this can happen. And this can affect the brain. It can push on the brain. But this is not classically a brain metastasis. OK. Have, has anybody heard the term leptomeningeal disease? Leptomeningeal disease um, is, is, a, is also a feared consequence of breast cancer. The leptomeninges is doctor speak for the coverings of the brain, okay? Now, if you have breast cancer cells that are lining the fluid or lining the brain, that's what's so-called leptomeningeal disease. The, the problem with this is getting back to what CNS is. The brain is in continuous com, uh, communication with the spine. It's bathed in cerebral spinal fluid. I don't know if anybody's ever had a spinal tap. But if you have cancer cells that are flowing all around your brain, they can at any point access any por portion of your spine or brain. These are notoriously difficult to treat. And now, subdividing it even further, brain metastases trials exclude leptomeningeal disease. So this is kind of the orphan of orphan populations, which is tragic because the outcome of many leptomeningeal disease patients is less than ideal. So a few cartoons that I stole from Dr. Anders. This is that blood-brain barrier I talked about. Essentially, this is brain where we want to keep things out. This is the blood. The blood can send oxygen in, but not chemotherapy. Okay, so by design, it's good. It protects us. But there's a time when cancer breaks this that we need better therapies, okay? Again, I make fun of Carrie every time I see this slide. This is the ugliest mouse I've ever seen. I mean, this is called a nude mouse. Um, not kidding. So anyway, her laboratory designs uh, clinical trials to uh, see if medicines can penetrate the mouse blood-brain barrier. She's developed um, literally a cell line that she can inject cancer cells in the brain and the, pa and the patients these nude mice can uh, grow brain metastases. So she actually studies breast cancer brain metastases in mice. Again, this is just another picture um, demonstrating how you basically inject cells into a mouse and then you can study them in the brain. It's a very busy slide. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. The point I'm going to make is similar to the point that I made earlier. Different breast cancer cell lines uh, or different breast cancer types tend to recur in different places, OK? This is medical speak, luminal A, luminal B. We all recognize the HER2. All of these little colored squares, actually, are thousands of different gene studies. So, you know, yes, ma'am? triple negative? Right, great question. So these triple negative, this is an excellent question. 80% of basal-like breast cancers turn out to be triple negative, but not all triple negative breast cancers are basal-like. So this, when we say ER positive, HER2 positive, that's basically staining. You take a special stain, you stain the breast cancer cell. So it's a good test. It's not perfect. This is if you take the individual breast cancer cells and sequence the entire gene of that. So this is more accurate. Um, but we don't know if it's still prognostic. So we don't know what this means. So that's why we're trying to further that. Yeah, I just asked the last speaker who never, who never mentioned triple negative. And I asked him why. He says, well, we don't know that much, but we're working on it. We're working. I mean, this, this is a work in progress. Um, many, and again, it's, it's kind of inter, it's not interchangeable. Many luminal A and luminal B are ER positives. HER2 are obviously overexpressing HER2. But this is basically just showing the bone, lung, liver, brain, the different receptor phenotypes or different breast cancers recur in different places. Again, all breast cancer is not created equal. Um, and a problem that, you know, when patients ask you, you know, what are my chances or how long am I going to live? Nobody knows that. I certainly don't. Um, but if you look at a lot of the data from brain metastases, it's all cancer types, okay? You can't tell me that you are like a 65-year-old smoker who's smoked two packs a day and has heart disease and 
10 brain mets. Lung cancer is not breast cancer. Breast cancer is not melanoma. Everybody is different. So it, you know, trying to compare you to them, I think, is it's not right. So other non-breast cancer specific uh, prognostic factors are age. Frankly, younger people tend to do better than older people. And a lot of that has to do with other medical conditions. Performance status, that's oncology speak for how active are you? Do you watch TV for 20 hours a day? Or are you up walking the dogs? Are you making your own meals? Or are you going grocery shopping? So patients that are more active, and I don't mean triathletes, or I mean if you're able to take care of yourself, have, they have a better, prognosti <coughs> better prognosis than if they can't. Um, the other thing that's important, as all of you know, is what's the disease outside of the brain? So sometimes we focus on the brain so much that we forget about outside. So in a perfect world, we would have chemotherapies that work outside the brain and inside the brain. And that's where we're working towards. And as I said before, the number. One, not good. One is better than 20. What do people feel like when they have brain meds? Anything. You can have a headache. You can have nausea. You can have vomiting. You can have focal neurologic dysfunction. One side is weak. That's an example. Too much doctor speak. You might not feel like yourself. You might have problems concentrating, which might be difficult to tease out since many women um, talk about chemo brain and uh, they don't, often they don't feel like themselves anyway. Stroke, seizures. Busy, busy, busy slide. Take home point is that there are various me measures. Anti-seizure medicines, if you've had a seizure, whole brain radiation therapy, radio surgery, which I will talk a lot about. Um, combining the two, and also systemic therapy, chemotherapy, okay? Not sure if anybody here has had whole brain radiation, but this is what a radiation oncologist sees when they treat whole brain. This is the entire brain. It's pretty, from a technological standpoint, it's really easy. You treat one from the side, the other from the other side. Very straightforward, takes a few minutes, okay? So, what are positives of whole brain radiation? It treats the whole brain, not just the areas of cancer. So that's really good, right? Because it, de it decreases the chances of developing new areas. I see you shaking your head. <laughs> I've heard it makes people tired. No, I mean, the, fati the, <laughs> the fatigue is overwhelming, OK? It makes people really tired. And it's not something that lasts for two or three weeks. People can be tired for months. Um, and again, as a man, this is, I, I, it's very easy for me to say, oh, your hair will grow back. It, that's actually not. This is a huge deal. It's a huge deal. And it often doesn't grow back as, as you want it. So hair loss is a very, very important thing. And when you ask lung cancer patients or some, certain other cancer patients, you know, it's, this is a uniquely important thing. Um, neurocognitive dysfunction. So I'm going to briefly talk about this. Problems with short-term memory. Months, years down the road, people might not be able to concentrate or remember as much as they used to. And it's a severe problem. Um, and in fact, we have a clinical trial open at UNC in concert with Dana-Farber trying to better study neurocognitive dysfunction in patients that get whole brain radiation to see if maybe we can improve on that. Now, I know that everybody in here has family members or, or have, you know, probably had radiation decades ago. Radiation today is different than radiation was decades ago. But in the old days, you know, like even 1970s and 80s, we would cause Alzheimer's-like dementia because we would use much bigger doses of radiation to the whole brain. We don't do that anymore, because obviously that's bad. Thank you. All right. <laughs> now, many of you, so I just t I tossed this in last night. So I, has anybody heard of Nemenda or Mamantine? So more and more patients are asking me about this. So for those of you who don't know, Nemenda is a drug used um, in patients with Alzheimer's disease. So non-cancer related, just Alzheimer's disease. And there was a big to quote our keynote speaker, phase three trial, which basically flipped a coin. Half of the patients got whole brain. Half of the patients got whole brain plus this drug, Nemenda. And to be honest, I do not routinely prescribe this to my patients that I give whole brain radiation to. Because the evidence in, in my read is in some patients, there was l l uh, less loss in a neurocognitive battery of tests. It was, it was basically an improvement in five points on a 40-minute on a test, which to me is not clinically significant. I don't know what that means. So patients that took this drug um, may perform better on a test, but the quality of life was no different. So add in another medicine with cost and potential side effects, I don't routinely do it. But we're, people are still studying this. So I don't know that some people ask you about it. If you've heard about it, say, I think the jury is still out. 
So is there an alternative to whole brain radiation? Um, yes, with caveats. So uh, radio surgery is not surgery. I'll define it in a minute. It's something that we at UNC do a lot of. Um, gamma knife, cyber knife, blah, blah, blah. We happen to use the cyber knife. Um, there's multiple different ways to administer radio surgery. We, I like this one because this is the one we have. Um, if somebody tells you that one is better than the other, they're lying to you. But I will talk a little bit about a cyber knife because that's what I use. So by definition, it's not six and a half weeks of daily radiation like regular breast radiation, right? So by definition, it's one to five treatments, but it's not the same size as of the treatment. It's much bigger radiation doses, okay? And in order to give much bigger doses, you need to worry about the normal tissue around you, the normal brain, okay? Or in the case of when you treat the breast, you gotta worry about the heart and the lungs. We could give any one of you or any one of your cancers a million units of radiation and, and kill the cancer, but potentially kill you as well. So radiation oncologists always have to worry about the normal tissue next to the cancer, okay? So we do this, this radio surgery, with very advanced technology, okay? These are old pictures, but these are still used. If, if anybody's ever had the gamma knife, it's a different way of delivering radio surgery. But you need to have a rigid immobilization where literally you, you go there in the morning, you get some lidocaine in your four corners of your head, and you get this screwed to your skull. Okay? It's a very accurate, very awesome way of delivering radio surgery, but it kind of hurts. Yeah. Okay? But it's great. It's a, it's a great technique. This is just another example of a different machine where you guys probably know this better than I do. It rotates around you. Here's a person's head in a frame. The reason I like the cyber knife is because we can do it without those harsh restraints, okay? This is obviously a cyber knife slide where it's built on a KUKA robot, and if I knew what a KUKA robot was, I would tell you. Um, <laughs> essentially, it's similar to the way cars are assembled, and it can rotate on various different angles, and I can show you. And when you rotate on various different angles, you can give hundreds of beams. So whole brain, one, two. These, I routinely, I treated a patient yesterday that had 298 little beams. Now these are, you know, less than pencil thick. And I'll show you that I purposely didn't make these Carolina blue, but it works. Um, <laughs> when you focus multiple hundred beams and they revolve around the same point, the area of high dose is concentrated in that small area. But the astute observer would say, well, what about, what about the low dose radiation over here? And that's something that we're also interested in and we'll talk more about it. So this is just a fancy slide of conformality. When something conforms to something, you want the radiation to conform to your tumor as much as possible, or at least the high dose. So by using a ton of beams, you can literally conform. This is tumor, and this is said critical structure. Make it an optic nerve or part of the eye. By giving uh, multiple beams, you can limit dose to this structure. But again, as I alluded to, you might give more low dose to the normal brain. Okay. Advantages of radiosurgery. Less fatigue, usually no hair loss, although I, I treated a, a lady who still makes fun of me to this day because she had about 40 or 50 different little like pencil size losses of hair, loss of hair, um, but she still makes fun of me. Um, one of the things that's important is we can't just focus on the brain. We have to worry about what's outside the brain. So oftentimes, the medical oncologists rush us to, she needs to get systemic therapy, so can you do this quick? Oftentimes, I can see somebody, you know, today's Saturday. We could probably treat her by Tuesday, and then right, and chemotherapy can start the day after or the next couple of days after. Um, now, I hate to throw a, a doctor word out, but there is something that your radiation oncologist needs to talk to you about. It's called radiation necrosis. And essentially, it's dead tissue, okay? Dead cancer is great, dead normal brain, not so much. And the body responds, even if it is dead cancer, but sometimes the body responds with inflammation, okay? It sends fluid, it sends things to clear things up. You can, if anybody here has lymphedema, if you ever get a burn or a cut, your body responds by trying to clean it up and then your arm gets full because it doesn't drain. The brain does the same thing. The difference, the arm can swell, the brain is, surrounded by bone. So oftentimes you can get symptomatic. And symptomatic, same symptoms as brain metastases, headache, nausea, vomiting. And as doctors, we are not smart enough with our imaging techniques to know what's radiation necrosis versus what's actually cancer. So sometimes, you know, you actually have to have surgery. And I'll, I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. 
This is just a, a zoomed in area. This is a small uh, brain metastasis from a breast cancer patient of mine. Um, and it essentially, the blue is 25% of the prescription dose. So by the time you get, this is a, less than a centimeter away from the metastasis, the high dose is only concentrated where you want it. Again, fancy pictures. This is a large metastasis, and by treating with several hundred beams, you can focus the dose around this area here, which is the area of interest. Okay. CyberKnife is, is good because you can deliver high dose with great accuracy. You don't have to screw a frame in. But again, why doesn't everybody do it? We can only do a few. And if you ask a radiation oncologist, that number's all over the place. I've definitely seen people do 15 or 16 at once, which I think is malpractice. Um, the number that you will commonly hear is one to five. Um, and I'll tell you why you can't do more. I will tell you, during my residency, I heard of a lawsuit of a man in Florida. He treated a patient with 88 brain metastases with radiosurgery. The reason he got sued was there was only 87. He treated the, 88, the 87th one twice. How do you count that high? I don't, I don't, I don't know. Anyway, um, the non-treated areas are still at risk for developing brain metastases. Okay? So the area here, this portion of the brain, is still at risk for developing brain metastases because we're not treating it. Okay? As you increase the number of treated, so this person had two treated. Imagine if you had a third, a fourth, and a fifth. These blue lines are lower doses. It's kind of like a weather map, you know, when it's raining, you see the, the, the reds and the oranges, or oh, that's 105 degrees. Well, this is 25 or 30 degrees. If you add up 30 degrees here, 30 degrees there, you end up getting more radiation to the brain. Um, and then you can get this radiation necrosis. So this is the lady I treated, okay? I treated this left frontal lobe met, okay? It looks very similar to what we treated before, right? She went to the operating room two weeks ago, and that was all dead tumor. She had to go to the operating room, though, because if you can see shift. the shift, this darkish gray is all edema. It's swelling. So if you were to show this to 10 radiologists, we don't know. We can't say, oh, that's cancer. No, that's necrosis. So this woman had a craniotomy. I mean, she's doing great now, but she had to have surgery. So this is one of the drawbacks. And this person only had one metastasis. So the risk of radiation necrosis is related to how big they are, how many you treat, and essentially how much dose you give them. What do you mean by the shift? So there's not, so if I were to draw a straight line between here and here, a directly 90 degree line, this center of the brain should be right on it. But because there's edema, it's been shifted. It's called midline shift. So it, it, the brain is getting crunched that way a little bit. So radiation necrosis doesn't always require neurosurgery. So usually what we did, and we actually did this for six or eight weeks, is we put her on steroids. Now, some people love steroids. Um, I've yet to meet those people. <laughs> Most people hate them. Um, they cause a million problems. Truth be told, the best treatment for relieving swelling related to this is steroids. Um, caveat, the best treatment is probably removing it, but most people would probably prefer a trial of steroids as opposed to having brain surgery. But sometimes it's necessary. So this is a slide I stole from a colleague of mine, which essentially just looks at whole brain radiation versus this focused radio surgery. Sometimes people call it stereotactic radio surgery. Um, it's not meant for you guys to you know, read all this, but essentially it's a balancing act. Sometimes somebody will come in and say, with six brain metastases, and she'll say, I'm not having whole brain radiation, I don't care what you say. I'll treat her with radiosurgery if it's safe. So sometimes we have to weigh those odds. The other thing that I think is, is very important is just because you do one now doesn't mean you can't do the other later, okay? And somebody says, well, I heard you can only do radiation once. That was my question. Right. Usually, that's true. That said, we retreat people all the time. All the time. I am. Um, With whole brain or SRS? Uh, great, great question. So if you need repeat whole brain, um, I would advocate for a different treatment. So because repeat whole brain, you can't give as much dose as you did the first time. So if you can't give as much and the dose you gave before wasn't effective, the chances it's effective this time is going to be less. You then run the risk of having worse neurocognitive dysfunction, worse memory, worse energy. Um, 
I've never done it in a breast cancer patient. I've done it in several lung cancer patients. So I, at that point, I definitely push for a clinical trial or some novel systemic agent. Um, but in terms of well, how many times can I get radio surgery, doc? It depends. More than once, usually. Not more than once to that same spot, but I've definitely treated women three, four, and five times. That said, nobody knows about the neurocognitive function after repeat courses of radio surgery, and that's something Amy and our group here have been trying to get funded. Um, we just got rejected again last week, but whatever, we'll get there. <laughs> um, because a lot of a lot of a lot of these people live a very long time, you know. And uh, tongue in cheek, I'll admit, you know, sometimes we have to spot weld you, you know, so you. <laughs> Um, actually, that's what the medical oncologists say to us. Um, we work everywhere. You only work where you point it. Okay. So this is an example um, of a, actually, I stole this from Google. So this is a large brain metastasis that, um, that's Dr. Google, so that, that actually needs to come out. So sometimes there is a combination that, that you need neurosurgery. And then oftentimes people say, well, if I have it taken out, I don't need anything else, right? The simple fact is having a brain metastasis removed is not like having a lumpectomy in your breast, okay? Rarely does it, a neurosurgeon get negative margins. If you were to get negative margins in the brain, you'd be cutting out normal brain, okay? And that would leave you with far more functional problems than if you didn't take it out. So oftentimes after resection, I, not oftentimes, I always recommend further treatment, be that radio surgery to where it used to be or whole brain. So whole brain is, this, is, is the right answer 20 years ago. So we're actually trying to study which one's better. And at UNC, we have a trial where we flip a coin and we randomize whether you get whole brain or radio surgery. And as of a couple months ago, we were the number one accruer to it. It's not our trial. It's a, it's a multi-institution. Um, yes, ma'am. Isn't it true that you know, just by looking at your slide that maybe it could be something like just fluid? You can see fluid, but sometimes you can't. So let's go back to this one. One thing that I didn't say is it's, it's not all black and white. It's not, OK, this is not cancer, it's all dead tissue, or this is all cancer, there's no dead tissue. Oftentimes, it's a mix. So a mix of recurrence. You know, cancer and necrosis. But I can tell you this is all fluid here. I can tell you there's fluid in there. I, would have, I couldn't tell you, now I can because I know the answer, I couldn't tell you if that fluid had cancer cells in it. So I did the surgery just to be sure? Yes. To find out 100%? Correct. And so the reason, so I had this gal on steroids for six or eight weeks, mm -hmm. and she wasn't getting better. And she was having side effects of steroids. So the definitive way to decrease the swelling is take out the offending agent, take out the thing that's causing the swelling. So once this came out, the steroids came off after a few weeks, but it, yeah. Yes, please. Because you used um, hyperbaric oxygen and maybe some other trenchal vitamin E along with that for radiation crisis? That's a fantastic question. Not in the brain, I haven't. People use it a lot for the chest wall, for head and neck. Um, I've never tried trenchal vitamin E or pentoxyphylin. It, it, it's something to think about. That's a really I, good I speak from experience because I had severe radiation crisis from one of my many brain tumors. Uh -huh. um, and I will tell you that the hyperbaric oxygen along with that, I don't know if the um, medicine helped or not, but made a huge difference. That's fantastic. But I could be different than anybody else. So. Right. <laughs> and, and you are, but, and again, maybe it was a combination of everything that did it, and that was the perfect cocktail for you. Yeah. But I'm glad it helped. Yes, ma'am. Polka dots, I love your sweater. Thank you. JK, yeah. I know him. Yeah. 
Um, so not all imaging studies are perfect. And referring to, so the question, in case people didn't hear it, is can there be artifacts or things on your scan that your doctor sees and could they be cancer? Could they not be cancer? Sure. So n we're all fallible. But when you see something that often, you know, that sounds like a duck and walks like a duck, most often it's a duck, not always. So sometimes you can get artifact, which is, you know, there's, an, uh, there's a problem with the MRI or there's a little movement and you can get a wisp of white, here we call enhancement. But if you see something white here, not all cancer is white, or not all white is cancer. So, I mean, there's a chance that that couldn't have been cancer. There's a chance that it was. So there's a chance it could be something else, too. Just because patients have breast cancer doesn't mean that they can't have another problem. Right. And then a few months ago, um, when I had my, I keep on getting repeat right now, sure. because they want to know what's going on there. So this last time, um, my cerebellization was real. You know, yeah. So I did have. I didn't have radio surgery. No, I had no surgery. Yeah, he's good at it. Do you have a question? So, uh, as an artifact, could it be that edema? What is it called? Edema? Edema? Swelling? I think it's eye. Ischemia. Ischemia? Yeah, so um, the older we get, the older our brains get, um, and there are what's called white matter changes, which, you know, often little ischemic events. Ischemia means less oxygen, so that we can have small little infarcts or little mini strokes, but or vessel changes, which are really nonspecific. So as we get older, sometimes it gets more difficult to figure out what's going on. And in reality, um, we've definitely seen patients that have metastatic breast cancer or metastatic lung cancer. I saw somebody this month who was a lung cancer patient and they came in and they had this weird looking brain thing and I said, that's funny, that doesn't look like a met. It turned out to be a glioblastoma, a primary brain tumor. So you just, we know what we know and we try to base on you know, what we think we know, but the, the only real way to know is to look at it under a microscope. Okay. Um, so people say, well, I've got, I only have three areas, why don't, why don't we take them all out? So we often underestimate brain surgery. Um, it's kind of a big deal, usually. Uh, and like I said, it's oftentimes, uh, we'll do it if there's one that's symptomatic. The most rapid way to relieve swelling and mass effect and pushing the brain over is, again, take the offending agent out. Um, Occasionally, you'll see two if you have two that are very symptomatic, um, but that, that is very, very rare. And here's the other question is, um, some women are diagnosed with breast cancer and X number of months, years later, go on to develop stage four disease. If all of a sudden you pop up with something in your brain and there's nothing else, we gotta know what it is. You know, It not only has therapeutic implications in how we recommend treatment, but it also Prognosis, you know, metastatic breast cancer is different than a brain tumor. Or it, it, it's just helpful to know what we know. And then again, I mentioned this before, after you have removal of it, we often need to add more radiation. A very busy slide. Not mine, Carrie Anders. So what can we do if somebody presents with brain mets and we treat, say she has three lesions and we treat them all with radio surgery? As I said before, the brain that we didn't treat is still at risk for developing brain metastases, okay? So that's, with whole brain radiation, like we said, we treat the whole brain, and it decreases the chances of developing metastases in the untreated area. It doesn't make it zero, but it decreases it. So one of the thoughts that we're interested in is, what's that? Again, so I could quote you a number, but it's from a trial from the late 80s, early 90s, which is not specific to breast cancer. It's lung cancer, melanoma. So the number is, the number is not applicable to you, in my opinion. But it more than halves it, but it doesn't make it zero. Um, so there's, you know, prevent, there's, there's, I'm not going to get into the, uh, the semantics of it, but there's different types of prevention, primary versus secondary prevention. Primary prevention is you do something to prevent the cancer from ever coming back. That's like chemotherapy after your lumpectomy or your mastectomy. Secondary prevention is for preventing further areas of disease after you've developed them. So if you've developed brain metastases, and in that scenario we treated the three with radiosurgery, but we didn't treat the rest of the brain, are there novel systemic therapies that can get into the blood-brain barrier or, or get through the blood-brain barrier and into the brain to treat that area that we didn't irradiate? And that's one of our goals, Carrie and my, um, we've 
trying to we've been trying to develop a trial and talking with various pharmaceutical companies to give radio surgery and then just reflexively put you on a, a chemotherapy agent that accesses the brain. Unsuccessful at this point, but that's kind of where we want to go. Isn't lipatinib? Lipatinib? Yeah. Ticurb? Yeah. Yeah, so so that does you, you ask a great question. So one of the reasons that HER2 positive women are more prone to develop breast cancer brain metastases is that Herceptin doesn't cross the blood brain barrier. It's too big. Its cousin, or sister, or however you look at it, is lipatinib or Ticurve, and that's an oral drug that has been shown to cross the blood brain barrier. TDM1, which is a newer Herceptin based chemotherapy, is a very big molecule, but there is evidence to suggest that it does get into the blood brain barrier. Um, we're interested in novel drugs, so these Herceptin-like agents that can't get into the blood-brain barrier. If you can genetically engineer them, and believe it or not, there are people that can do this, to a molecule to, which basically goes to the brain and helps push it in, for lack of a better word, pharmaceutical companies are busy doing that. And in fact, we just recently, I, I think it closed, we had a trial open. We were the only center in the United States out of the Amsterdam with a molecule that had one of these things that just tries to push the drug in. So it, it's very complicated. Um, but we're working on it. Back. Another HER2 agent, Progetta, is it, do we know if it's You know, so Pertuzumab or Progetta is, is new-ish. Uh, it's probably the newest kid on the block. I must say that I don't know of evidence that it gets in. But, but I, I would ask a chemotherapy doc. Yes, ma'am. Zolota. Zolota does. So, so Zolota is a, is a drug we use often. Um, the platinums, cisplatin, carboplatin, um, that have shown efficacy in triple negative breast cancer patients, we often recommend that. So th this is a perfect segue. So Carrie and I, um, along with our chairman of neurosurgery, Dr. Ewand, who's incidentally married to Lisa Carey, who's also here today. Anyway, just throw that plug out there. <laughs> Incestuous. So we developed um, what we think, and actually we, I, th I think we're right, the first um, breast cancer brain metastasis dedicated clinic um, ever. Um, we meet every Wednesday morning and talk about a niche population. We only see women with breast cancer that spread to the brain. Now, granted, people aren't beating down the door. It's not a very busy clinic. But um, <laughs> in the first year, we went live in August of 2012. I think we saw 50 patients. Um, this is ballpark. And 35 of them went on some kind of clinical trial, which I think is important. Um, we have anywhere from four to seven clinical trials open at any given point. They're not all treatment trials. We're interested in neurocognitive function in women that get treated with radiation. So some of them are just studying their neurocognition, their, their memory function. Um, and Carrie is constantly getting these novel systemic therapy trials open that allow, that not just allow, are targeted to women with breast cancer with brain metastases. And like I said before, that that's an, that's an exclusion criteria for almost all stage four breast cancer trials. And then we're working on something for leptomeningeal disease, because like I said, that also get you kicked out of even the brain mets trials. This is a very busy slide. The reason I'm putting this in is just to say that it's not just me, her, and Matt. We work with a lot of different people. We have um, people in the labs that have PhDs and don't even see patients that are developing drugs that we try to use. Um, we have a, a dedicated onco-psychiatrist, believe it or not, that exists. And in all honesty, his group, I don't know if anybody's sticking around tomorrow, I strongly encourage you to see, um, I'm totally blanking. Justin Yop, don't tell him I said that, I love him. They were, f they were featured on NBC, uh, not local NBC, but national NBC, for dealing with um, young, young fathers who become single parents. This man, I, I think he's out of town, he's like, a, he's like a, a, a prophet. You talk to him, you just feel so calm. Anyway, he, he works with a group, he's interested in neurocognitive side effects. Um, tissue is the issue, people say that all the time, but it, it's true. We're not just studying breast cancer patients, uh, we're trying to study the metastases themselves, and not just a lung met, but when we do have neurosurgery, we are sequencing those genes here at UNC to try to get better. Um, 
And then we have this imaging, or you know, this radiation necrosis question. We have a protocol open where we're trying a new pet. You know, I'm sure somebody in here has had a PET scan. We have a new agent, not a new agent, but an agent that we think may be able to help tell us. So in people that we're sending for surgery, we'll, we say, hey, we, you're going to surgery. We don't know if this is cancer or necrosis. Let's get this new PET scan and see if it tells us. Um, that just opened recently. So how do you get into Boom. Oh, sorry. How do you get into what? A clinical trial. Yeah, so, well, you have to ask your doctor about it. OK. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to toggle back between my last two slides. We actually have a website. This is UNC. This is actually our cancer <laughs> hospital. My office is right there. Sorry. Um, we meet every Wednesday morning. There's another fant uh, that's not what I wanted to do. There's another fantastic resource, and she was brought up that, that um, who runs this. If you've ever heard of this website, if you haven't, I'd write it down. Um, it's basically a list of all relevant clinical trials that's updated regularly for women with breast cancer and brain meds. Um, the US only correct. That's correct. Um, but if I had like $100,000, maybe I could fly down and Right, yeah. and get a coffee ground enema. You know, I, did, did you see? Did you see that that thing? So believe it or not, everybody laughed, and she kept saying, "Really, really you would be surprised." Orange juice IVs. It happens. Um, but anyway, so th this is, I think, the biggest take-home point. But I keep doing that between all the, this talk is that brain metastases again, like breast cancer, it's a spectrum. Um, I can tell you that I've, I have one current patient, a patient who's six years out with leptomeningeal disease, okay? Um, we need to do more, we need to study more, we need better trials, we need better drugs. Um, but take home anything, I think this website is a great resource from when you leave Chapel Hill. Yes, ma'am. Um, you talked about uh, looking at um, two, uh, tumor tissue. Yes, ma'am. What are you seeing the differences between the tumor tissue from the brain uh, versus the original breast cancer or other uh, met sites for the individual The simple answer is I will tell you when we find out more. We, we haven't done enough of it yet, and in fact, we have. I, I do know that there is so-called phenotype heterogeneity, that sometimes you're ER positive and then your metastasis becomes ER negative, or likewise, HER2 positive. So that's one of the reasons why we always recommend for, for a new diagnosis of stage four biopsying to prove and to retest the receptors. And if you're a long-standing metastatic patient, and you had been responding quite well to your hormone therapy, and all of a sudden you don't, you, it may be worth the discussion to rebiopsy to see if you're now ER negative or if you've developed a HER2 positivity. But I think we need to wait a little bit longer to know more. Yes, ma'am. Are you doing any intrathecal chemo for brain? We are. Okay. We are. So our paradigm for treating intrathecal, intrathecally are women with good performance statuses with no actively progressive extracranial disease. So oftentimes, the, yeah, we, we do do that. What is that again? Intrathecal. So what that means is essentially you get, you can do it two different ways. The most annoying way is to get a repeat um, spinal tap and get the drug instilled, essentially putting the chemotherapy in your spine and it rotates all throughout the brain. Um, or you can have what's called an Omaya reservoir, um, which is essentially a port for your brain. Yeah, it's not as painful as it sounds, but I'm sure it's, well, I've never had one, but I mean, p patients don't complain about it as much as I would think. <laughs> Great question. So methotrexate is one. We often use a lot of Aris-C, which is cytarabine. Um, and there is interest. We have not done it. Um, I know one of our colleagues in, EC, in Greenville, North Carolina, Eastern Carolina, has used Herceptin intrathecally for her two positive cancer. And there was talk at the, so the TBCRC is in, um, a group of 16 breast cancer groups that we are intimately involved in. It stands for the Translational Breast Cancer Research Consortium. Translational science means you're doing something in a lab that's not patient related, and you hope it can then translate into the clinic, meaning treating patients. So a lot of the, the, the trials that we talk about there are basic science-y to get them into the clinic. And so there was talk at last year's meeting about an intrathecal Herceptin trial. But uh, the problem, and those patients are very rare. So when you design a clinical trial, you want to be able to get patients on it. And thankfully, 
for most of us, those patients are very rare, but unthankfully for the patients that develop it, we really don't know what the optimal treatment is. But people do do it off trial, intrathecal Herceptin. You mentioned the registry. Yes, I didn't, but I had it up there. You were astute. <laughs> Research. Yeah, no. But anyway, uh, do you just, do oncologists just put the number of patients on the registry? So there's, this is a, I think what you're, this is a different kind of registry. So there is something, a registry trial when you're trying to see if a treatment works. We are developing essentially a longitudinal observational study where everybody that we see with brain meds, and in fact, every woman with breast cancer that steps into our hospital gets approached and all you gotta do is give one tube of blood and then we follow you. Um, we're just registering these patients on an observational trial where some people are looking at them and helping us data, uh, gather their data. Yes, ma'am. So I almost threw a slide in and chose not to. Um, a 44-year-old patient of mine, BRCA positive, metastatic ovarian cancer, was treated for brain mets by a radiation oncologist that I don't think should practice anymore. And she had the largest area of radiation necrosis I've ever seen. And in fact, there was a small uh, phase three trial out of MD Anderson, a pretty famous hospital, where Avastin is used and it actually is was shown to be helpful in treating radiation necrosis. Um, that's not done by everyone. All, one of our neuro-oncologists at UNC happened to train at MD Anderson, so she put the patient on it. Um, I don't know if enough is known. I mean, the, the Avastin story in breast cancer is one that's started out great and ended crappy. Um, but, you know, maybe, maybe Avastin will be used, but I know that some people use it for radiation necrosis. Yes? Mm -hmm. Why don't we scan those brains like right from the get-go? That's a fabulous question. Um, do you do that? No, I don't. So <laughs> counter to that point. So there's something that we call PCI. I can't even believe I'm saying this, but don't, don't even write this down. I didn't say it. <laughs> Prophylactic cranial irradiation. In patient, there's a small subset of lung cancer called small cell lung cancer. Small cell lung cancer spreads to the brain. Some people say 80%, some people say 100% of the time at some point in the disease course, okay? Multiple randomized trials, phase three trials, have shown that even when there aren't brain metastases there, giving them whole brain radiation without cancer there makes them live longer. Probably because there's microscopic cells that we can't see. The reason I'm telling you this is some people kind of tongue in cheek say, well, if patients with metastatic triple negative breast cancer have a 50% chance of developing brain mets, should we give them prophylactic cranial radiation? I, I don't think that will ever happen. Um, I think that whole brain radiation has, so small cell lung cancer and breast cancer are two entirely different diseases. Patients with small cell lung cancer tend to die and they tend to die quickly. As many of you in this room know, patients with metastatic breast cancer can live a very long time, long enough to deal with the side effects of whole brain radiation. So why don't we scan them? There isn't good evidence to suggest that it makes a difference. That was me being a physician. Um, no real good reason. I mean, honestly, the, co the amount of cost of all of these screening MRIs, we can talk about mammography until we're blue in the face, or PSA screening for men, and does it improve survival? I honestly don't know if on the global level, if we screen everybody, if we can make an impact. But honestly, if somebody said to me, hey, listen, doc, I had 10 positive nodes after chemotherapy and I'm triple negative, can you scan my brain? I'll scan the brain. The insurance company may give me a hard time for it, because there's no recognized guideline to prophylactically scan a woman's brain. That's just the way we are. But it's a good thought. I mean, it's, you, you might want to advocate it. So here's the other thing. So recently I was talking to a patient is, well, why don't, why don't, why don't I get scans every three months? Um, some docs do routinely scan the patients and some don't. Because there's no evidence that if we start treatment when you have a brain metastasis, 
that it would make you any live would make you live longer or if we instituted therapy before you developed them because there's something called lead time bias so if I wait for you to become symptomatic so say you develop symptoms in five months and I wait for you to become symptomatic and then treat you if I scanned you at three months and had them I might I'd start your therapy sooner but there's no evidence that you'd live any longer than if I had waited those extra two months it, it seems, well, HER2 positive breast cancer and this triple negative, we seem to find higher amounts of brain meds. Has anybody ever, and I don't even know how to do this, but thought about the fact that maybe the women that are estrogen positive, um, are, they're getting a lot of things that are small molecules on, you know, after therapy, that maybe that's what keeps them from getting brain meds, possibly? I don't know. I, you know, hormone stuff uh, when you're taking pills. Um, maybe think, that makes the difference. I think it's a great point. I think that if you go back, um, forever. Almost like so, it's prophylactic. Right. So <laughs> ER positivity is both prognostic and predictive. So ER positive patients it predicts that you will respond to tamoxifen or any of the aromatase inhibitors. But it's also prognostic. Without hormone therapy, patients with ER positive tumors tend to live longer than ER negative tumors. So it may be something inherent in their biology. Maybe one of these blue dots instead of this red dot makes it from not spreading the brain. And I, I don't think we know. It, it's probably a combination of the two. And, and when we simplify things, you know, staining something. So we have ER, PR, and HER2. I mean, these are thousands of genes, like down on the level. There's so much we don't know. But we're trying. Yes, ma'am. I'm going to be very honest, I don't. Magnesium 3 and 8? No. Is it a nanoparticle? I don't think it can hurt. My, my thought on complementary and alternative medicine is if it works for you, it works for you. Right. I mean, I would never, I, I think it's complementary, but not alternative to normal medicine. But I definitely think that it helps people. What do you think the focus of San Antonio might be? That's a better question, I think, for one of the medical oncologists. The San Antonio Breast Cancer Meeting is a great meeting. I love going to it. But there's not a lot of local therapy. I'm a local therapist. You know, I was joking around that my radiation only works where we point it. Um, the, SA, the San Antonio Meeting is much more chemotherapy. So I honestly don't know. Lisa Carey would know that. She probably already did yeah. Other questions? So uh, the whole brain uh, radiation treatments now, are you uh, not a fan of those, or because like you have 20 or more lesions, that's the only route to go? Right. So. I think I'm more a fan of it than some patients are, but if I can avoid it, I'd like to avoid it. Um, but I mean, there are clear indicate. I mean, if somebody comes in with 15 areas, their, the treatment that is in their best interest is whole brain radiation. And one thing I, what's that? A lot of us had whole brain yeah. for radio surgery. Yes. Yeah. And I will tell you, one thing I didn't talk about is that some, you know, in temporally in time, sometimes you get whole brain radiation later, and then you get radio surgery if you develop new metastases. Or sometimes if somebody comes in, say, with five or six brain metastases or one huge brain metastasis or one dominant one that is not going to surgery, sometimes I will do the whole brain radiation and then do what's called a boost, where it's a planned additional course of radio surgery or an additional course of radiation but their first course of radiosurgery. Even though there isn't a lot of good evidence to support it, but intuitively it makes sense. Big things need more dose because there's more cancer there. I can't remember if you addressed this, but if you have leptomeningeal involvement, can you treat it with SRS or only with uh, Fantastic question. 
typically not. That said, the one gal that I have who's six years out, she got whole brain radiation, and then I've since treated her twice for small, new brain mets, not the surface mets, because that radio surgery, you cannot treat for that. But if somebody develops new leptomeningeal disease and a radiation oncologist is offering radio surgery, you should go to a different doctor. Shall we break? Thanks for your time. Oh, you got one more. Yeah, how do you distinguish um, uh, between uh, mm -hmm. uh and I, I mean, Sarah just had uh, uh, radio surgery on a three-to-five millimeter ablation. Uh, whether it was uh, the MRI wasn't really clear it's on the door, but uh, pressing in. Mm -hmm. area. Um, I, I've heard this song before. It's very, it, it, again, our imaging, the, one of the take home points, our imaging tests aren't, aren't perfect. And sometimes you can't tell if it is in fact, and there's a difference. You can have a dural based or a met on the surface of the brain, but not have it circulating in the liquid, in the CSF. So the only way to do it classically is you do repeat spinal taps and you actually look at the fluid under, if you're that concerned of leptomeningeal disease. If, it's a, if it looks like a dural or the dura is the lining in the brain, um, you can treat it and not worry about left of disease. It's a good question. We were told 85% chance the radiation would take care of it, 15% uh, chance. I support that. I support that. Yeah. I might say 90. It depends on how big it was. Three to five millimeters. I'd probably say it's higher than 90, but that. It looked like three ping pong balls. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your time. Oh, great.